wanted to ask you about oh, any professors that stood out in dental school and also any of the parting that went on in dental school. Well, you, well, which type of professor, good or bad or all? Oh, anyone that you had trouble with, let's say. Oh, well, that was easy. About 80% of them were non-entities, you might say, nondescript people that couldn't make a living practicing in private practice. And uh, some of them just stood around with, as we say, a thumb up their seat. Didn't know anything. Others tried to devil us to death, but they didn't get anywhere. We were all right out of the military, except six. There was 126 in the class, 120. And incidentally, that's the roughest bunch of people I ever around in my life. I worked in the oil fields, the wheat fields, on a surveying crew, <clears throat> in the Navy, and of course the Blue Jackets, they weren't any problem. They were well adjusted, that's the sailors. And we highly respected them, I had to get that in. We always fed them first, and they always left the ship first when they go on liberty. But uh, then, nevertheless, up there, we had some of just dumber than hell. But we had uh, <clears throat> this one that was crazy, and I said I put him in his grave. I think that's what you're alluding to. Yeah, possibly. Well, that was Spike Huntington, and he was he was good on what he taught. Now he knew nothing about pharmacology. He taught it later on, but that summer, and uh, he was up there lecturing one hot summer afternoon, no air conditioning, and this fellow named Dimick and Filer were sitting right next to each other. And one of them asked the other one, said, what kind of a test was that? And this old fart just threw a fit. Hold on, hold on, smoking, and I'm luxury. And oh, he just went off his nut. Just balled him out and shoot him out for where hell wouldn't have it. So I saw him later on. He had him in his office, and he was just laying the law down. And my roommate there, Harvey Heffley, he said, well, doesn't bother Demick at all. He looked like Mandrake the magician. Nothing phased him, but Demick was real serious. And he said, Demick flew a B-24 over the Pulaski air raids and said there's 80% fatality. And his nerves are shot. And when it comes time for a final, he can't eat for two or three weeks before the final. And I said, I can understand that. I said, he has reasons. And he said, then he has to learn to eat again and he vomits everything for two or three weeks. And his nerves were really shot. And he was in a prisoner of war camp after that. And he hurt his leg and he had no treatment on that. So I, that dwelled on me. That was in the summer of 47, between the first and second year. So it was during the last year while we were uptown, and oh, he made these guys give a lecture on we were drinking at the bar up at the downtown or across the street. But I got to thinking about that, and I spotted a telephone jack, and I asked a waiter, I said, say, can you make a phone call from here? And he said, yeah, if it's local, I want to call an independence. The old fool lived out in independence. So I'll, I'll pay for the call. So we'll just tell the operator to call back on time and charge us. Well, that's side the point. So I called the old fools around midnight. I said, hello, Dr. Huntington. Yes, who is it? What is it? Well, this is R.B. Reed B., like in Baker, of the senior class. And we're up here having a few drinks, and the ones around this table, we just want to let you know what a damned old son of a bitch we think you are. In fact, you're an insane, insidious, evil, psychotic jackass. And oh, I just really called him everything in the book. Of course, I was drunk, too. And, blah, 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 blah. and I just laid the phone down pretty soon. My waiter said, well, whoever's on the other end hanged up, so I'll take the phone. I said, well, that's all right. I wasn't listening to him anyhow. He was talking. 
So the next day, the president of the senior class, he said, Bobby, did you call Dr. Huntington in the middle of the night and call him a son of a bitch? And I said, well, I imagine I did. I told him everything I could think of. Well, he thinks someone in a sophomore class did it. And he said, unless the guilty person came forward, <coughs> the whole class was kicked out. They were going to take the sophomore year over again. And I said, well, hell, he can't do that. I said, look at the money the school is losing. I said, I'll go straighten it up. So I went in and had steel doors. So I beat on the door and I kicked on it. And, and the old fool said, this, who is it, what is it? And I slammed the door open and make a hell of a crash. And I said, this is I, R.B. Reed of the senior class. This was I who called you at that unhallowed hour of the night and spoke so disrespectfully to you and I of you. Now what's all this horse shit about kicking the senior? the junior and sophomore class out and said, two or three people have almost had strokes, two or three are getting ready to quit school. And I said, Jesus Christ, I said, you're insane, like I told you on the phone. I said, you're an insidious psychotic jackass. And I said, worse than that, if I could think of the words. And this old fool says, no, Reed, just take it easy. You've got to get up and go to do anything like that. Some cowardly bastard forced you and coerced you into making this false confession. You haven't got the guts and the get up and go to do it. You're running in fear of your life. And I said, oh, bless you. I said, worse than that, I left. <laughs> well, anyhow, I said, kiss you well, you know what I mean. Anyhow, <laughs> so I go back and tell the president of the class, I said, the little son of a bitch won't believe me. I went up and told him, and he said I didn't have to get up and go to do it. And he said, well, what are you going to do now? I'm not going to tell the dean. So I told him, went out and see Dean Reinhardt, Dr. Reinhardt, and he said, well, Reed, let's just not have any more discussion on it. Let's just forget it. He said, uh, everyone will be back in class tomorrow. And uh, he said, incidentally, he said, you're in charge of meeting places for Delta Sigma Delta, that is a dental fraternity, the three of them, and the rest of them, and I am. Well, it seems to me as so though one of them threw a grapefruit through a wall at the LaSalle Hotel and during one of your meetings or parties. I said, yes, sir, they got carried away, but the wall was just a piece of oh, beaver board, cardboard, a wallpaper on it, and I said, we paid for the damage, it was $25, and so they were happy, never pleased, yes, I understand you. So then someone threw a grapefruit out of the window of the Bell Reef Hotel and broke a neon sign, and I said, yes, sir, we shouldn't have done that, it might have hit someone, we paid for that. And then you were impudent to the president, well, the manager of the president hotel, and I said, yes. He got mad because we had some, we, he said that he wouldn't rent us a room again. He said that it was a sense, ostensibly rented for the purpose of holding a meeting. He found out that we served mixed drinks and we played cards and we had some women up there. And I said, yes, sir, nothing queer about us. And they were up there gave a, an exotic dance, we'll say. And uh, I said, oh, a freight elevator man stabbed him to death later on. The guy was a homosexual, and he kept tormenting this demented freight elevator guy, and the guy came up in the middle of the night, and he slept down in the basement where hotter and up to hell, and he came up and killed him. That was later on. So I said, yes, sir, that was it. So we let that drop, and he said, then let's see, oh yes, you called a, caused an elevator to fall over at the State Hotel, I believe. I believe that's where it was, the stats. And I said, yes sir, we had a meeting up there. We got through and we were on the eighth floor and we pushed for the elevator and it didn't show and there was an indicator on the outside of the wall showing where it was, a hand, like a clock. And I said, so, Finally, we just held a hand on the buzzer and said, 
finally it moved and went up one floor and then down one. And what it was, the operator was pretty old about us being impatient. So finally, we just kept on that buzzer. We could hear the thing buzzing as it came on up. It was really loud. And he opened the door and he started running his mouth. And I grabbed him like that, tear his shirt, and threw him against the wall across the hall. And we take over the elevator. So this one guy, he pushes it and full down. And I could see that hand, and I said, you better let up on that. We're, we're nearing ground zero. And he said, well, we're down here with the, down at the bottom. Oh, Jesus Christ. And instead of letting go of the handle, he reversed it to full up. <laughs> and broke the cable. But fortunately, the time the cable broke, we only fell about two or three feet, but it hit some springs and we bounced quite a few times. And uh, we took the top off of the elevators, the escape hatch there were neural screws. And by that time, the people ran the hotel uh, knew something was wrong. So they opened the door. Emergency, they had an emergency key, and the elevator between the first floor and the sub basement, or the ground, or the, it was just there. So we called out and we took off running. So uh, that what the hell they, what the hotel people were worried about at the time was was anybody injured. Well, this elevator operator, I guess he made his way down later on, and told them that we'd taken over and he wasn't responsible. One of us that took over. And all they were going to sue us, and I said, go ahead, go ahead, see what you can do, I don't care. So Dean Reinhardt says, well, I guess that's it, I just wanted an explanation. And he said, well, I recommend that you not meet at the same place twice. <laughs> now, wasn't that a lot of discipline? He was a prince of a person. But he had these three dollar bills teaching. But this father, this Dr. Huntington, I tormented him all the time. I could throw my voice and mimic my voice. And he'd get up there and he'd know nothing. He'd say, now, man, close your books and recite. Now, we have to marry us. Drag them over, no importance. However, be on the final exam. No, everything was important, be on the final exam. So I'd mimic the old fool. And one time he put on a movie, and I noticed all of a sudden, after a while, he was over it on the side seeing who was paying attention who wasn't, and one Chinese boy had his glasses off. And he couldn't see without them, and he was going to raise hell about that. So he got to raising hell with him, and said, yes, yes, man, now we have to marry, blah, blah, blah. Oh, the old fool went crazy. So he got up in front, and he said, they're just a bunch of cowardly bastards. And he went on and he said, you think you're so damn smart? And he went on and he went and really got psychotic and he got to hitting that podium, that oak table with his hand and we thought he was going to break his hand. Pretty soon he goes, oh, oh, oh. he didn't know where he was, just completed a stroke of apoplexy. <laughs> and uh, this old gal was in our class, she was a part-time instructor and part-time student and she was about 40, 45. Mrs. Roth, we called her. Well, she got up. She said, well, help it, help it. Get up, get up. Read your cause, all this. You get up. And I said, don't call me by my last name. So she looked, so she got a couple other wild mattered people. And they led the old fool out. So a couple of days later, we're in another class, of course. And so I said, well, Mrs. Roth, where's Dr. Huntington? Well, he's in the, at the sanitarium in Anapendus, and I said, he should have been born there. <laughs> well, not that type, it's a medical facility. Oh, oh, I thought it was a nut house. Well, that's where he should be. We ought to transfer him. Well, she, ah! well, she had a crush on the old fool. <laughs> we thought he was about 100, but he was about 55. And <laughs> we thought he was about 100 as kids. And anyhow, so they passed the word around two or three days later, and they said that Dr. Huntington died last night. So we all left, and no one else was showing any reaction or any daddy at all. And just as we got to the door, there was this Mormon there, looked like a basset hound, saggy-eyed, 
I turned around and spotted him, and he said, Yes, yes, two years too late. And I horse laughed, and the whole damn class did. My roommate, he said, Well, Bob, I don't mind shadowing you. He's watching you. He's right over you. You put a jinx on your head. I said, Well, if he is, he is. It's just something that I have any control over, and worry accomplishes nothing. <laughs> well, anyhow, well, everyone in school hated the old fool. And uh, they had a service out of D.W. Newcomer. Well, they had what they called the visitation one night, I don't know, middle of the week. And so this Mormon went out there with this Puerto Rican. And this Puerto Rican didn't know the customs. He said, oh, there he is up there now. And that casket, can we go up and look at him? No, no, this is not the time the undertaker will tell you when to. He said, I haven't you seen enough of the old son of a bitch as it is? So anyhow, it went on and he said, pretty soon this guy, this Puerto Rican, I called him Umbriago. He said, Umbriago got up and went up and looked. And of course, upset the whole proceeding, you know. You can imagine that Some during the middle of a visitation. And I guess this preacher had a fit. And, and I said, weren't you there? And I said, no, I didn't care for the old son much alive. I didn't care anymore for I'm dead. <laughs> well, anyhow, that ended that. <laughs> this Puerto Rican was a, his name was Jose Luis Ubinas. And uh, he was noisy and disruptive and all. And he was, reminded me of a small donkey. Well, anyhow, one fellow there got to call him Umbilical. And I said, that's not a very good name. Let's call him uh, Umbriago, Umbriago. So they started doing that, and oh, he reacted on that. It was Portuguese, he spoke Portuguese or Spanish. And so he went up and accused one guy of it, Bud Wright. And he said, no, it was Mordor, that was my nickname. So he's the one that started it. So he came up to me and he said, Mordor, why is it? Why did you hang that horrible moniker upon me? And I said, do you not know what it means? I said, well, yes. I said, in Italian, it's a drunkard. I was multilingual. And I said, in Portuguese and Spanish, it's a drunken carouser. Oh, well, he, he knew then, this fellow Filer, ironically enough, he said, he got the message, you weren't any dummy. You were way ahead of him. So I ended it, but we got along pretty good after that. But he was still noisy and disrupted. But oh, he hated that name, Umbriago. Well, Dr. Reed, you have to explain your nickname, Mordor. Oh, one fellow, he was telling about his military experience. He said he was stationed at the Army base there in Atlanta, Georgia. And I said, that'd be the one right across from the Naval Air Station. Yeah. I said, a hell of a commotion here one day. I said, one guy came in and they had taken off in this cabin plane, and the rudder jammed, and the plane went at an awkward angle, and they'd stay in the air at the, the rudder was useless. And they said, but he'd give a full lap, but if he cut the power, it'd go out of control. So he told everyone to bail out. Well, one guy opened the door, and that straightened it up. So he said, disregard that, stay in the plane. So he brought it on in. As he was coming in and slowed down, he said, more door, less door. So that went on like that. So I was telling this guy that, that was Mormon. He was a two-faced son of a bitch. So he go around and tell them that it was me. I was supposed to upset me, it didn't bother me any. I said, no, unfortunately, I wasn't the pilot. I said, I was a pilot in training. I said, that guy there got a commendation for saving the planer and his crew. Well, anyhow, they all thought that, some of them did, that it would uh, upset me. But it didn't. It bothered me damn bad one way or the other. In fact, I thought it was funny. So that's how that Mordor <coughs> came on there. I'll tell you one guy that thought he was really insulting to me. Great big fat guy. And he and his wife and his daughter worked at the lab. Does that ring a bell? 
Oh, let's yeah. not do last names. Huh? Let's not do last names. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Anyhow, I ran into him over to Cove one night. Well, one of them. And I said, Yeah, who are you? And well, I'm Harry somebody. And I ran that lab. I managed the lab. Well, they didn't do a damn thing except mail packages. I said, Oh, horse feathers, horse feathers. You didn't do a goddamn thing but sitting around with your thumb up your seat. And I said, you never ran anything. I said, what the goddamn hell is wrong with you? Oh, I just, just cut him down to shreds. And your father had fired his wife and the two girls for some reason or other, but he fired them no uncertain terms one day. And just took them clear out. Ronnie had to remember that. He was there at the time. So it wasn't his best evening. And someone said, well, he's pretty big to be talking that way about. I said, yeah. But he'd have to catch me. That time he'd be out of breath and I'd thump his gourd, but good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, somebody said you didn't need any help. You could take care of yourself. I said, I could. All I had to do was take off running if he followed Noah, which at least winded. <laughs> so that was, but he really thought he was going to be insulted. Then he went on that. I said, don't come around here in public. Give me such a rash or horse shit like that. He never did anything. Oh, I just cut him down to where hell wouldn't have it. His wife just went on in. She just got put away from him. I guess she had always made the living for him. But uh, that's how that name Mordor came on. They thought they were insulting me, but they weren't. And by me, honey. Dr. Reed, what's your uh, connection with undertaking and hearses? Because you always used to come down to Frontenac in a hearse, and were you hauling people around? And no. No, when I was a kid, I went to work for an undertaker. I was 14, and he hired me. He thought I was 16. He thought I was his older daughter's age, whereas I was his younger daughter's age. And he hired me. I was big for my age. And I stayed there six years. And uh, the time I left, I was making 62.50 a month. But one guy was married, was making a hundred, and another making a hundred and ten. So it wasn't comparatively speaking down too bad. Another one was eighty-five. He had had his license a while, and I just barely got in mine. But anyhow, I remained friends with them, and they'd sell me these cars. And I got one, and gave it to your father a car. I still remember that. Yes, I do. Then I had a 47 Chrysler limousine, then I had a 56 Cadillac, and I sold that to a big guy from worked there, James, James Pope. Right. And uh, it's, well, still was, in, it's still in great condition, I understand. Oh, yeah. Actually, I sold it to three of them, your father, James Kushik, and James Pope. And I said, $225, and I said, the engine... It's been abused. I said, drink soil. Well, didn't bother him. But he ended up, he bought it for his father. And so that got rid of that one. So I had that 64 Cadillac hearse. It was in mint shape, except somebody had vandalized it, broken the windshield. So down there, and your father said, uh, well, I guess it was you. Were you the one that bought it, or Eric? No, one of them was around during my time. I, I remember a Fleetwood one. There's here. Yeah. He says, Daddy, I wonder if Dr. Reed will sell us that car. Um, I don't know, I might ask him. I said, well, I got it on the market. I said, I put a price of 600 on it, but I haven't gotten any takers yet. And your father said, sold. And I said, now, wait a minute. If that windshield's cracked, it's going to cost a couple hundred to fix it. And it won't pass examination. Your father said, boy, it will down here. You can get a, a safety sticker through the mail, through the, over the telephone, down front and back. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, you're cutting up here, though. <laughs> so that's how I got rid of that one, how it ended up down there. See, I've given him that 54 Chrysler, or 51. I believe it's a 51. 49. Oh, I remember the Fleetwood. You, know, you remember the Fleetwood? Yeah. That, that was the Cadillac yeah, maybe it was. sedan or hearse. Oh, it was a sedan. Yeah, well, this was a white one. I'd had it painted white and had a sign on it. And Eric went up in your grandmother's backyard and opened up the sign, and they called the bulls. The bulls got after him, and they said, 
He said, Danny, they told me not to blow. said that they better not catch me blowing that siren again once more this week. And he said, well, did they say anything about next week or next month? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. just you know, don't blow it this week. But they finally confiscated the siren. Did you know that? I think they did. They took it off. And, uh, That's back when they were running the chicken fights. Well, yeah, well, that was about the time. Yeah, so. And, uh, of course, they just sold it for booze, is what they did. They stole it, the police. Yeah. But uh, I told them, I said, well, I'll bring charges against them. Charles said, I don't know if I would. He said, they'll put a jinx on your head and they'll throw a knife in you at night. And he said, you don't know the people down here. Well, I guess I don't. <laughs> One time I was down there and I had a brick and so this patrolman gave me a citation of $35 for, said you entered his lane of traffic. It was there at Grasshopper Corner. Remember where that was? Yeah, I was, yeah, right. And I was coming along here half asleep, so I was going to go straight, so I just kept going straight. And this guy came out of nowhere from around nowhere the curve, yeah. And hit me, but the broadside. thing of Bighorn? It was broadside. He hit you broadside. Yeah. But anyhow, what it was, it, <coughs> right here there was a sign 20 miles an hour, one back here 20 miles an hour. And he must have been going 40 or 50. And he was a nice guy. He was hardware salesman, Ray Stone from Mendon Mines. And he had had something like 12 wrecks in the last 11 years. He just a uh, erratic driver. Well, anyhow, this patrolman gave me a citation and said, you did enter his lane of traffic. I said, yeah, but he's traveling to beat hell. And he said, well, speed limit's 45 along here. Well, I just investigated, later on found out it was 20. So I called this judge down there, and Charles said, he's an insulting person, Judge Beggs. Did you ever know him or Beggs? He said, can I just send you a damn check? I don't want to repair it for some ignoramus. Just got real rough. Then it better be good, too. Why, you little bread son of a bitch, where do you mean telling me something like that? You work for me, I don't work for you. So I got to call him. Well, Saturday night, Sunday night, two or three in the morning, and your father told me, said he gotten his telephone number changed, he's got an unlisted number, he's got his phone taken clear out. And then he, I think he told me, or somebody did, might have been Sam Cicero, they're zeroing in on you. Oh, I think they asked your father, any of your doctors have come down here, have they had a wreck or something? Not that I know, I don't pay any attention, none of my business. He wasn't very diplomatic to him. <laughs> so anyhow, it went on like that and I got the ticket dismissed because he was exceeding a speed limit. The patrolman just wasn't aware of it. He didn't go back 200 feet and see it. The sign went from 55 to 20 on the corner. and. Uh, he finally, oh, I think your father told me that he just finally resigned and retired. And one lady here in town, well, why did you do those things? Well, at the time, I thought it was funny and appropriate. I was drinking. <laughs> well, why would you drink if you're going to do things like that? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I got to drinking, well, I'd do anything I pleased, more so than even when I wasn't. Well, with speaking of that, have you, you've been married a couple times, haven't you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, well, can you explain? <laughs> well, about the best way to explain it, uh, I was in talking to my banker and I said, well, just one more payment and I'll have these diamond rings paid for and I'll have everything paid here. And I said, she's got an assignment on my income if it ever goes over for 6000 this last one, and I said, boy, I said, where did I ever find two such women? He says, oh, I couldn't be for saying. Well, I said, I meditated on that, and I said, come to think of it, I didn't. They found me. <laughs> they were in dire circumstances, and they were bound to tell they were going to get someone. They'd lie, and they'd cheat, and they'd connive, any way they could to get me to marry him. 
So the preacher down at my church, he was going to blow me out. He was a hard-nosed German. He's judgmental and condemnatory, and I ended up chewing him out good. Well, I said, well, I said, well, she wants to talk to you. She just wants to explain why things went the way they did. And I said, they went the way they did because she got the house. It was, it was about a $12,000 house, and we paid it down. And I said, she did roll off herself, and she's tied into my Social Security. I said, I've signed that. And I said, what the best, well, I just think you're just gloating over the fact that Dorothy is upset and hurt. And you're enjoying it. And I said, I think you're a goddamn heathen. And I said, I think you're judgmental and condemnatory, and I'm not even going to waste my time talking to you, so just shut your goddamn mouth and breathe your nose. Maybe you better walk away while you're still able to. That's why I talked to that Episcopal priest. He didn't say another word. And I did it for two reasons, too. He was getting free dental work. Then you're complaining about things. And I made him a partial. And I said, well, we'll just charge it the cost of the casting. And then he raised hell about that. I think it was $45. Well, I don't know. I said, I wouldn't have it done. I said, well, just give it back to me, you son of a bitch. Well, let me see it. And he gave it, and I just bent it like that. Said, now you don't want to a goddamn thing. Well, anyhow, that ended that. That was the marriages. And I said... My poor mother was rather domineering, rather bossy, and rather haughty, but she just gave me one word of advice, said, you're going to have to take control of yourself. And control of your life, said, otherwise people will think you're simple-minded. So I haven't been married since. I didn't get married the third time. Does that tell you anything? I listened to her. Well, she gave good advice. <laughs> And I said, well, I was simple-minded to come to think of it. Well, I made this preacher madder than hell. She talked to him and lied to him. Said, he's only contributed $35 all the time you've been married. And I said, well, she's drawing Social Security for three children, and I pay for the hospitalization and the medical on all of them. And I said, I make the payment on the house, I make the down payment on the house, I keep the car in repair, I keep it full of gasoline, both of them. And I said, she comes and tells you that, and boy, I show him a stipend there where I'd thrown out quite a bit of money there in one year. And oh, well, I wasn't told that. Well, I've been lied to, and I'm. I'm sorry, and I regret that. And I said, well, so I told her. I said, Father Kunkel says this and that, and said, that's not true. And I said, here, well, I show him. And I said, I want you to go tell him that that's not true. Well, she never did. So, uh, Dr. Reed, I, <clears throat> I, I recall that you probably have done more free dentistry. Oh, I did a lot of it. Than anybody I've ever known. And how did that come about? Well, a lot of it there, I was very charitable. I was very good hearted, and I do it to deserving people. But some of them just beat me out of it. They'd lie to me and cheat me. But somebody that needed something done, well, I'd do it for nothing, or little or nothing. But getting back to what I started to say when I ran out of film, very, very poor, impoverished people are very hard, difficult to treat them. They're good people, but they're suspicious. And they're paranoid. They like to strike out at anybody they can. I found that in the funeral business, too. At some stage of the game, when someone's bereaved, bereaved, they'll go through different stages, one of which is they'll strike out at people. But there's very, very poor people. They seem like they love to be persecuted and love to be hurt. I don't mean physically, but just harmed. They like to find fault. But what I was laughing about was one guy, he and his wife came to town in this barber shop over there, a rather big one, a nice one, befriended them, so he set them up in business that she would clean the place and he would shine shoes and they got paid for it. So they told me, he says, they got a head toothache, they go ahead and take care of them if they don't pay you. And I'll take care of it. 
So I extracted a tooth for him and for her. And she says, my grandson said, he's gonna come up here and kill you if you hurt me again. And like that, and I thought, well, they're just ignorant people. Well, this guy showed up with a jaw swelled out like that. So I gave him a great big slug of penicillin on the hip and got it. And he says, I still kill him, man. And I said, I'll tell you, we can't inject it with Novocaine because it spread the infection. And I said, also, I said, it, it wouldn't do any good. I said, it never get to the nerve. And I said, but we can paint it with this local anesthetic and detach it gently around there. It'd be about like picking your fingernails, painting them, or picking your teeth. I said, then we can yank it out all at once. You said, let's go for it. So I did that, and I said, now, as soon as I get the tooth out, get your head over this cuspidor, and don't you swallow anything. Hell, the pus flew out of there, must have been a teacup full. And, uh, well, that was all for nothing. So anyhow, this Turner said, well, Barbara, he said, what do they owe you? They left town in the middle of the night. They took a... So I gave them $10 so they could make a change on the shoe shining part, and they pried the door open, and took the money and left. And I said, well, they did essentially the same thing to me. They got mad, so they wouldn't have to pay the dental bill. And I told them, I said, I'll tell you what now, you pay half of the costs of it, and I'll make them teeth. Now, they won't work because they're free. I said, there's a dollar bill between a denture and the mouth that never work. Well, anyhow, we were going to extract those people's teeth. They were just like they'd fallen out of their mouth. But all they elected to get mad. Now, that's the poor people for you. And people that are down on their luck. But, uh, other people, the ones that had the money, one particular case I remember was a woman from Hume. She came in and I suspected something strange about her and funny. She wanted a set of teeth made and someone was extracted them for her. And I thought, that's strange. Why didn't they go to the same dentist? Well, anyhow, I proceeded to make them and had your father set them up in wax. You've seen that, of course. So I try them in there and look at them, and I says, that looked like what you want there. I forget her name now. Well, I don't know. So I said, well, let me go get them there, and I left, and she was gone. So uh, about three or four or five days later, well, the girl who worked for us said, she's out here, wants to talk to you. And I went out, yes, some of those teeth fell off there. Well, hell, they weren't finished. They were in wax, pink wax. I said, oh, we'll come in immediately. And I said, I'll tell you what, we'll set them in there in real solid stuff. And I'll promise you, if any of them fall out of there, then I'll replace it. Well, all right. Well, that's the best you can do. I said, well, that's pretty good, I think. And so I took the wax ones and, well, I just finished it. But I told her, I said, now what we need here now before we start to finish them is payment in full. I said, you know what they look like and you've tried them out and they work all right. So now we're going to set them in there permanently. Well, she wrote me a check. So I shut the office down, drove from the beta where she lived and presented a check for payment. The banker said, well, we don't know about this. We've got to wait. You ought to deposit it. I don't need anyone to do my thinking for me. You either pay it or don't pay it. But shut up about it. Oh, so I got my money. <laughs> and uh, she came and got the teeth. Well, you sure put us in a spot. You cash that check too soon. Now we don't have any money over there. Oh, I said, all right. Well, I gave her the teeth and I was really afraid to do it. I thought, I should have come back to me on a lawsuit if they ever got a canker sore. <laughs> but uh, people like that. Another one, I got some partials made, ironically enough, from Nevada. Sort of strange people drive from Nevada to here when they had good dentists over there. I beat her to the bank over at Nevada. <laughs> got my money. 
And the other one where I just deposited the check and the bank sent it back so they stopped payment on it. So I investigated and found out that they had actually paid it. But then the banker over there prevailed upon the banker over here. It was a damn louse and a drunk. And to uh, stop payment on it. And from that time, I had the feds in on them, the bank examiners, <laughs> and got them in a mess of trouble. And he told the girl who worked for me, you're going to kill me. And I said, well, tell him I haven't changed his address, my address. <laughs> well, he hadn't yet. He died instead. He's out of Evergreen Cemetery, I think. <laughs> but anyhow, the people were like that, you know, the chiselers and all. And that's their bottom, you know, they walk out and they'll say, well, I'll pay you next time, and then they wouldn't keep the next appointment. And I'd tell them, so I don't mind you not paying for the work you've got done because you may not think it's any good, but God damn it, you tied up my office for an hour, and I resent that. And that's $36. Well, you weren't doing anything, you didn't have to work. That's all right, I still have expense, and I'm entitled to make a living. Well, I just, re I just give them hell, just... Just go rough shot over them, but I wouldn't go rough shot over anyone who, unless they were chiseling. In other words, if bullets are flying over my head, I'd go rough shot on them. But does that answer? That, an, that answers the, the question. Next one, please. Oh, I'm going to return to aviation. Yes. Do you know anything about the Golden Gate Bridge? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, we're stationed at Alameda. We'd take off and get, get permission to fly under it. And we'd be cautioned that there were static cables hanging down to demagnetize the ships as they came into the dry dock or into the port, mm -hmm. you know. That's about the extent of it. But uh, came in one time and I think. I'm not right sure, I can't recall it exactly, but they gave us permission. I told them, I said, we got eight chickens when a carrier came in the port and they'd always tell, have the airplanes take off. So they would be able to have more room to work aboard ship and then they could work on the planes better and the ground hanging, they could the aircraft carrier. But I asked them permission for eight chickens, which was eight fighters fly under the Golden Gate Bridge, and they said, yes, caution, static cables. So we did that, and some old fool blew the whistle, ready to sell about it, so it wasn't necessary. But the first time we came back into San Francisco, like this is the Golden Gate Bridge, or three spans, I think, if I recall. And we'll say this was the bridge. We'd be out here, and we could spot it. And I said, no damn way we're going to get under that bridge. The ship's not going to get under. Of course, there's curvature of the water. <laughs> Does that tell you anything? Yes. <laughs> oh, one, one gal lived across the bay there, and we came in, and she lived over here at Sausalito. And so I called her, and told her, said, well, I'm in town, I'd like to come by and visit with you, and I have my friend with you, do you have a girlfriend with you? And, well, yes, I have. Well, when will you be there? Well, we're going to have to eat, and then we'll be over. Well, I thought you'd take us out to eat. Well, I raised hell. Well, I'll be damned. I said, come to town broke one time, and you're ready to cut me off. Oh, just shoot her out something terrible. I wasn't broke at all. And I said, there, the only reason you want to go out with me is to eat. Of course, we were up to Norrisley good, too. Oh, so she quieted down, my friend said, say, I don't want to go over there and enter that hornet's nest. And I said, you don't think I'm going to make an appearance, do you? <laughs> she wrote me a bad letter. <coughs> she knew where to find me. So we stood her up and kept her waiting all evening. Of course, you know what I did. I wrote back and said, well, my heart just bleeds for you. I actually said my seat just bleeds for you. 
So that's beside the point. But we were an honor to them bunch. So treated women real nice, always did. So they started going rough shot of them. Man, no way. Like, you ought to take us out to eat. Well, we're down broke, and here you are, and you're not interested in us. And so I shamed her into accepting the date. Was where she made a mistake was writing to me, she's raising hell about it. Otherwise, I always thought, well, hell, they weren't there anyhow. <laughs> she wasn't that smart, but she probably got that smart. Now, next question. Next question. Oh, boy, I don't know. You've <clears throat> covered a lot of stuff here. Well, I got the time if you got the patience and the time. Well, do you have any? No, no. Well, well then let's, to... let's cut it off.